All right, let's get started. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just saying there was a meeting until 7.01. So anyone who was trying to get in before then got a, a message that there was another meeting, but yeah, it could just be us tonight, which would be great. Or some other folks might drift in, but why don't we get started with the meditation and then um, we'll have time for, for me to give a talk and for us to talk together. Um, yeah, and for anyone who's new, um, this is a, an ongoing group that has been meeting for a couple months. We're covering a list of 10 virtues in the Buddhist tradition. So today we'll talk about the fourth one, which is wisdom. Um, so yeah, let's settle in for the meditation. So just taking our time to arrive wherever we are in our homes. Noticing what's present, maybe noticing how the body is tonight, comfortable, uncomfortable, comfortable in some places, uncomfortable in others. Noticing any ambient sounds in our space. And noticing how the mind is not needing to judge. And just the mind is like this. We can bring in this aspect of wisdom this um, way of seeing a perspective that whatever is being known in the body and in the mind is just the nature of the body and the mind, just the nature of, of the body and the mind expressing itself lawfully, conditionally. So that can take some of the pressure off taking it personally being for or against it, trying to hold on or trying to push it away. And instead of relating in that way, we can be interested in the causes for constriction in the body and the mind and the causes for release. And maybe just in beginning that orientation, that way of investigating, way of being interested, we can notice some energy and some relief that we're putting all the other things that we could think about, worry about aside, and we're just taking up this contemplation here and now in the present moment what supports constriction in the body and the mind, tightness, struggle, and what supports release and ease, peace. So this gets to be our
topic of contemplation. And we're not hunting down a conceptual answer, but investigating directly. And in order to feel directly constriction and release, we need to be present, embodied, feeling what we feel here and now. And this is not our usual mode. We tend to be on one level or another, caught up in thinking and organizing and trying to get a handle on things through the conceptual mind. This is more like feeling, feeling our way. Feeling the texture of the mind and body, just as it is. Letting it be as it is, letting it express itself. Staying interested. If there's unpleasantness, we can ask if there's aversion, not liking. There's pleasantness, we can ask if there's clinging, holding on. If there's neutral experience, we can ask if there's distraction, disconnection. But even that doesn't have to be a problem. From the point of view of mindfulness, meditation, we just want to know What's the mind doing now? So there can be a peace and the pleasantness, no matter what's happening, just in that orientation, that simple orientation of mindful awareness. So instead of trying to figure anything out, we can just encourage ourselves to stay close, stay interested, 
just in whatever we're, we can already know or whatever the mind is already knowing naturally. We can think of mindfulness as the intention to remember to be aware of what's being known. So the mind is always knowing something. That's the nature of the mind, to know different objects of experience. And we're just remembering to recognize the present moment's experience. That's our job as meditators. So it's not a lot of strenuous effort. It's just the effort to be interested, the effort to remember, to remind ourselves of this intention. And to sustain that interest, and to remind ourselves to relax, and to practice seeing whatever's being known as just nature expressing itself. The nature of the body and the mind, things as they have come to be for me right now. So let's continue in silence, finding our own way to sustain this balanced, interested, present moment awareness.
for the last minute or so of the meditation, you might want to practice with your eyes open. Letting all the sense doors be open and still we can be interested in the mind that's aware. We don't have to give all our attention to sights and sounds, different objects of experience, thoughts. At the same time that we are aware of what we're aware of, we can know that it's something being known. So let's just take a few seconds. Feel free to stretch, get a drink of water before we begin with the talk and spend time for discussion. So thanks for being here, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, so yeah, welcome. For anyone who's new to the group, like I was saying, um, we've been meeting uh, for a couple months and uh, we're covering this list of 10 virtues called the Parami. Um, and now we're on the fourth, which is wisdom or clarity and yeah, I've been really enjoying leading the group and hearing from everybody, hearing from everyone. I was gone for the last session, but I heard it went well. Stacy McClendon covered on the topic of renunciation. I love renunciation, so I was bummed to miss that one. Um, people may disagree on that, but I think it's great. And I might just start tonight by recapping a bit the first three, because I think I don't, I don't quite understand like, you know, all the history of how this list was compiled because it was compiled after the time of the Buddha and, you know, the order, but the first three definitely, um, generosity, ethical conduct and renunciation in that order are found in different lists, um, including from, from the Buddha, from this, the early discourses. Um, and so then, and then wisdom comes next, um, and I think it it makes sense, and you know, there's probably different ways that they could be ordered, and um, but it ends with equanimity, which is often the last in many lists. So, and I think Ajahn Suchitto in his book sort of tells a story about how these progress, and so I'll take my cue from him on some of that. But I, I think it does make sense, um, starting with generosity, which is sort of just this basic orientation that uh life is more than just is about more than just me getting what i want and getting rid of what i don't want um in that in that really narrow sort of way of like accumulating experience hoarding experience like if i can just line everything up just right and you know that is our orientation a lot of the time and that is sort of the default in terms of societal conditioning you know that's kind of yeah, but it's you can we can tell that that it's kind of a sad way to live that there's isn't sort of any greater purpose than that, and so that's just in in Buddhism there isn't really a reference to some you know higher being or higher power God that sort of tells us what to do or you know if we believe in a certain doctrine then then that will make our lives meaningful so. But just that basic orientation, which we can check out in our own life that, you know, 
seeing our life as more than just an isolated being doing our best to survive or to get what we want, but that we exist, you know, in this relational field and that that, and that that is a huge part of our lives, you know, and that's really generosity, Donna sharing, uh, Ajahn Suchita talks about it as just a really simple way to have a more fulfilling, have more fulfilling kinds of relationships. And I'm, I'm sure we, if we were all to review the relationships in our life, present and past, part of what makes any of our relationships feel fulfilling or um, pleasant or uh, worthwhile is some aspect of this, of this sharing, you know, whether it's with friends or partners or teachers, it's that like reciprocity and that receiving, you know, how good it feels to receive whatever it is from somebody, their time, their a kind word, uh, and then how good it feels when we find we have the energy, we have the capacity to offer something in some way. And this is really kind of the, yeah, the most simple kind of um, wholesome relationship. So that's first and foremost, um, the, the idea sort of being if we don't have some some sense of that, that orientation that uh, it will be difficult to, um, yeah, to understand other teachings. So the Buddha, when he would encounter people who didn't have other spiritual practices, you know, beginners, um, he would start with with talking about generosity and then talking about ethical conduct, which is just follows on from that. Um, recognizing that other beings like us don't want to suffer uh, and that um, this is a way to take care of ourselves and take care of others to be careful with our behavior um, because it has a big impact. Again, if we were to review our, our life and the, you know, the places we feel regret still maybe or places that we feel we've been hurt by others, you know, we can tell that this uh, human beings, we, need to be careful <laughs> because we're not enlightened and so we have you know we're kind of walking around with all of our stuff all of our baggage and so i really see ethical conduct as this this care um that's a really beautiful thing and that's how it's described in the buddhist teachings as sort of the most beautiful adornment you know i think we have that sense of people where we get a sense that they're they're careful like they're not careless and it doesn't have to be something tight but um, you know, they have composure, they have a set of values that guides them. And um, it's a beautiful thing in this world where so many people are careless and, you know, and so much harm is done through carelessness. And I'm sure we've all, you know, caused harm through some version of carelessness. And this is, uh, like we talked about during that session, doesn't have to be uh, a source of self uh, judgment, but this sort of sense of a conscience and uh, taking responsibility for actions is really, yeah, it's really uh, gives us a lot of confidence. Actually, it can be a healthy source of self esteem, just our ongoing refinement in that area. So those two together, I see is really kind of the foundation of how to be happy on like a, the most basic really relational level if we want to be happy you know there's so many things we could think of what i need to be happy but maybe the most essential is you know doing our best to cultivate this sense of belonging to um you know that we can't help but be in relationships so then what kinds of relationship do we want to cultivate and we can't control other people but we can uh orient towards well what well, what might I be able to offer? You know, in this world where everyone's struggling in some way, it's hard to be a human being. What could I do to make things a little easier for myself and for others? And to find that the heart actually, there's joy in that. It's like, uh, I think Shelley mentioned at the half day retreat on Saturday, a quote by Viktor Frankl, Holocaust survivor about like, you know, everything can be going wrong. This is a paraphrase, but sort of the last thing you have is your attitude, you know, and stories that we hear from that time and other times of struggle, 
um, where people are enduring really horrible, unjust conditions, and yet maybe we we can always, you know, there's something we can do, something we can offer, and that that is um, that that's what that's more what's under our control or our influence than than external conditions. So it's empowering too. So then from generosity and, um, and ethical conduct, those are sort of stabilizing factors in our life. You know, maybe we start to feel a little, yeah, more, more comfortable, happier, our relationships, you know, people, yeah, they can be sources of, of joy and ease and we have less remorse. And maybe our life, yeah, is working a little better on that relational level. And then the Buddha would talk about the sort of, even when things are going well, that there's there's drawbacks still to that orientation of, well, I just need to keep accumulating even wholesomeness um, or, you know, pleasant experiences. Because the idea is is that Donna and Sila are also good for us. They will make our relationships work better and, you know, we'll have more success. People will trust us more. And so on, even on a worldly level, the idea is that uh, Donna and Sila support uh, worldly happiness, sensual happiness. Um, but then renunciation is seen that there's, that all of that uh, is limited and the orientation of just pursuing more and more of it is stressful. And there's a happiness in, um, yeah, stepping back from that, just that orientation, that identification with um, accumulation and um, yeah, even with good things and um, with sensual happiness and that there can be a happiness of contentment and yeah, that we don't need to follow all of our desires, not because they're bad, but because there's a peace that can come from, yeah, a different kind of peace that we won't know if we're constantly following desires. And this is, this is where it starts to get a little bit less intuitive maybe, because we might think that, well, yeah, even, you know, I'm, I'm not just pursuing sensual pleasure anymore, but I'm pursuing wholesome, wholesomeness, wholesome relationships. But it's just that we can still be identified with all that, and that can still be stressful. So we can experiment with, well, I could, I could do that, but, do, but I don't have to. And so that's really the flavor of renunciation. It's not that any, you know, that sense experience is bad or, you know, wholesomeness definitely isn't bad. But do I have to identify being the one responsible for all that? Or can I just take a minute or take 30 minutes when I meditate and we're specifically at least in mindfulness meditation, we're not trying to make anything in particular happen. Um, so there can be, yeah, a renunciation of everything else we could be doing while we're meditating. And instead, we're just interested. So it's kind of this more neutral, more, uh, yeah, almost like a scientific orientation, like, what can I learn about the mind? And that that's really where a deeper happiness will come from is understanding the ways that the mind gets caught up and identified in its pursuit of whatever it is and that um yeah there's a happiness that's about simplifying or just not being identified with all the activity it's just what it is it's just nature maybe i don't have to be for or against it and that 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 flavor of peace is is not that common. <laughs> and so it takes some time. Uh, the Buddha himself said about renunciation, when I first heard of renunciation, my heart did not leap up. But it was when I saw the happiness of renunciation, something like that. Not having to follow all our desires, maybe there's a peace there, but it's a different kind of peace than gratification. And Gratification is a real kind of happiness. But the question is, 
is not needing, not being dependent on particular conditions? Is that a deeper kind of happiness? And it doesn't mean we don't have preferences. We do. But if things don't go our way, are we completely thrown overboard by that? So renunciation is a really interesting one, but I'm, I'm sure you all got a good chance to talk about it last time, so I won't talk too much more on that. But I think it, it does lead into wisdom in the sense that if we don't ever experiment with renunciation, with not following everything we could follow, it's that sort of stepping back that's sort of disengaging, disentangling that renunciation fosters that makes the space for wisdom. It's like we can't be completely enmeshed and engaged with trying to control our life in every little bit and have that perspective that uh, leads to wisdom of seeing everything as nature. They're sort of mutually exclusive. We can be aware of our, you know, our tendencies to want to control things, but that is not being identified with it. That's observing it. So that's how renunciation, sort of like meditation, just to, for 30 minutes, it can be a radical thing to do. For these 30 minutes, I'm not you know, optimizing every minute of my day <laughs> in terms of pursuing the things I'm pursuing. And, you know, it's, we, we are doing something, but it's, uh, but it's a different orientation. It's the orientation to understand. And that's really what wisdom is about, that desire to understand. And there's something in that, the desire to understand that, uh, yeah, it's a different kind of desire. It's not the desire to control. It's not the desire for a certain outcome. It's the desire to understand. And even understand may not be the, you know, a perfect word because it's not just to understand intellectually, but, um, yeah, to, to learn from our own direct experience to, um, yeah, just to connect the dots. Wisdom is what connects the dots and uh about in particular suffering and the end of suffering and that's really the gist of the of the whole of the buddha's teachings as maybe you've heard the buddha saying that he only teaches suffering and the end of suffering so in that sense wisdom that that word can be a little misleading because we might think it's about accumulating knowledge or information so the translation of clarity is a little more uh, kind of functional. It's a it's a activity of mind. Uh, how we understand what's happening, um, what we're doing with it, how we're relating to it, all of that is the domain of wisdom or clarity. I'll read what Ajahn Suchito his little description for wisdom. This is from. Uh, the set of 10 cards that he has that I've sent out before on the email list and I can send them out again. And if you want to get on the email list, you can, um, in the in the calendar on Common Ground's website, there's a button or a, a link you can press that will send me a request for that or just send me an email. So he writes, Ajahn Suchita writes uh, about Panya or wisdom Recognizing the skill of clarity, I aspire to check my assumptions with awareness and careful reflection and thereby arrive at an unbiased understanding. So it's very uh, active. I like that about this. Uh, I think we can get into trouble if we get too caught up in wisdom as being smart, being learned, learned, having a lot of information. And it's tricky because there is a lot of information in Buddhism and we can read a lot of books. And for some of us, that can be really helpful to read a lot of books. Um, but in terms of what actually in the deepest way liberates our heart, it's really, yeah, it's more like know-how, which is a translation I think Ajahn Suchito has given. It's like how you navigate through a forest, like, you know, our bodies 
have their own kind of wisdom. And, you know, if you're walking through uneven territory, uneven ground, you know, the body will adapt to that and, you know, be careful as we move. So it's that kind of wisdom. It's that kind of, um, yeah, it's really functional. It's really like how to be a human being and everything that we've learned throughout our lives where we maybe think, yeah, I think I'm a little better at being a human being than I was when I was 16. It's that kind of wisdom. It's like, it's earthy. It's uh, it's about suffering and the end of suffering. In terms of Buddhist Buddhism, that's the wisdom we're interested in. Not, you know, even how many Buddhist teachings we can recite, you know, how many lists we know. All of that can be helpful, you know, if we're using it to illuminate our own direct experience. But like anything, um, we can get attached and think that we'll be free if we, yeah, if we have enough information. And the Buddha specifically talked about that in terms of his teachings on views, um, which is one of the four uh, ways that the mind gets flooded, which we talked about on the on the first class. Um, so it's specifically pointed out you know, this tendency that we have uh, to, yeah, get, take views, take information, opinions, perspectives as sort of like, this will save me, you know, if I, now that I have the right information. And it's totally understandable. And especially with teachings like Buddhism or other wisdom teachings that make so much sense and that actually really help us. I think actually the Buddha said in one discourse something about, um, uh, like there's one kind of attachment that is onward leading and that's attachment to the teachings, something like that. So if we're going to be attached to something, attached to, you know, attachment to these teachings, which are so helpful, is probably, you know, not, not the worst kind of attachment. <laughs> So I'll talk a little bit more and then we can have time for discussion, but I want to talk about three kinds of wisdom, which Ajahn Suchitta talks about. So theory, which I was just talking about. So we need, we actually need concepts um, in order to have new information come, come in, which then informs the next one, which is practice. So we put those teachings into practice and then there's realization, which is, we've tried out the teaching and it it works and we see for ourselves oh this works this is this is onward leading this is the way and that's a direct kind of scene which um is really clarifying um we're not just relying then on other people's wisdom or information it's something we've seen directly and we could attest to it we could say yes i i have seen that ill will is painful or whatever it is so something simple like that, or however we might express it. But yeah, we need to start with theory because um, that's sort of the predicament we're in from, from the Buddhist perspective is that we're, we're deluded. <laughs> we, think we, we think we're seeing clearly, we think we're seeing things the way they are, we think we're acting rationally, or we think yeah, we, we sort of think we, we already know the way things are. Yeah, and usually it's some version of, yeah, I'm this way, I'm this kind of person. And yeah, either I like that or I don't like that or it's other people's fault that I'm suffering or it's my fault because I'm so bad or whatever it is. But we sort of have these, these stories and they sort of go unquestioned. And so without, you know, without wise information we ju can just go on repeating thanks for the message jonah yeah no worries if you have to if your internet isn't working thanks for joining um and this will be recorded it is re being recorded so you could listen later if you wanted but yeah so we need we need information that sort of is new and we've probably all had that experience i know i I did a lot when I first encountered the teachings. It was just, we can have powerful faith, powerful confidence, or at least curiosity arise from encountering 
teachings that make a lot of sense and that sort of point to how our minds work. And so, yeah, this is a really important um, thing. And it's a really, we can be really grateful that somehow these teachings are available to us and, and not just teachings, but also teachers and, and spiritual friends and community that, uh, that there's a, a culture, there's a tradition of people in the middle of our busy, challenging lives, people making the effort to, to practice and to keep the teachings alive, to remember them, to remind each other of them. Like, hey, I think you maybe weren't completely truthful or you like, or, you know, or want, you know, people that we feel we want to show up and be our best selves, be kind with and so on. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, a phrase in the early Buddhist teachings that uh, the voice of another is a requisite condition for our ongoing development. And I love that. And it points to this being an oral tradition for a long time. We need the voice of another so we can, uh, we can be grateful for those voices that have come our way, you know, and, and, and writings, of course. because it inspires us to practice. If we didn't have those, those invitations, we wouldn't be inspired to practice. But it's because we read, you know, we read enough or we read a little bit and it's like that, that makes sense that we then feel, okay, I'll try it. I'll try it out. And that's where, yeah, that's really the bulk, the bulk of it is um, taking those teachings, whatever little tidbit, we don't have to know at all, but even if it's just, you know, like this teaching that the Buddha has on, on ill will, which is really provocative, that even if bandits were sawing our limbs off, um, we should not give rise to ill will. And it's like, it's very extreme, but I think the point is basically ill will is never helpful. I mean, we can still, we should do it we can to protect ourselves, but in terms of our own mind and how it is affected by ill will, by hatred, you know, pointing out, yeah, just that. And this is something that we, we check out. Check out, is ill will ever helpful? Maybe it is, but we, we can check it out. And even just that question and that extreme example of like, like, wow, the Buddha said a lot of things that made a lot of sense. Maybe I'll I'll at least entertain that possibility. And the point isn't to believe, you know, that, that ill will is never helpful, or, but to see what we can learn about ill will and about goodwill and their effects. So it's always leading us to check it out for ourselves. And there's so there's so many teachings obviously that that we hear about and that we we can check out. I mean, the most fundamental is the teachings on on mindfulness, which is really the mechanism by which the learning of wisdom happens. So to even just that to hear about this idea of of mindfulness and what even is that? What is awareness? Am I aware? <laughs> Is there present moment awareness? Well, I'm, I'm conscious all day long, but what's the difference between being conscious and being aware? And so, yeah, this is on this level, we, we contemplate it, we think about it, and we check it out. Well, you know, this invitation to be aware. Uh, yeah, I think it takes, it's, um, yeah, there's obviously a big difference between the, the concept of awareness and the experience of awareness. Um, to be aware of our mind states and where and what effect they have. So all of that, it's much more interesting in practice than in theory. So the theory is great for having a sense of the lay of the land and just a sense of 
some confidence that this makes sense, at least on an intellectual level, what harm could there be from being aware? And especially in being aware in order to see what leads to suffering and what, what leads to release, it seems like it makes sense. And so then we try it out. And um, just one more I'll mention in terms of sort of perspectives that we take on and practice. Uh, the Buddha talked a lot about the value of this perception of seeing things, seeing the, the changingness of things. Um, I think he said it was more valuable even than a whole day spent cultivating goodwill, which is really valuable, is even just a moment where the mind really sees in a deep way the changing nature of experience. And I think it's because that has the potential to really uproot some of the delusions whereby we cling and then get into a lot of trouble. You know, if we see that there isn't a thingness even to cling to, because when we see things as just this continual flow of experience, there isn't really room for things to crystallize. And we notice that it's when things crystallize that we feel, oh yeah, well, no, I am this way or that person is that way. And we can create a lot of, a lot of problems. So I think that's why this perception of impermanence is really highlighted and it leads on to the perception of unreliability or dukkha. If there's no thing, uh, if things are constantly changing, then they're not reliable in a, in a deep way. We can, you know, we have pleasant experience, unpleasant experience, but it just keeps moving and changing. It's not really, a, you can't really make it stop. <laughs> and now I've arrived and yep, it will just continue to be pleasant. It will just continue to be this way. So it's that uh, perception that when we try to, and when, and when we resist that and try to hold on, try to say, now I've got it, and then things change, then we, we suffer. So that unreliability, it's not, you know, it can sound like bad news, but again, the question isn't whether it's ultimately metaphysically true or not, but what effect does that way of looking have? So if we're seeing things as uh, permanent and reliable, and I just need to get the right conditions and hold on to them, what effect does that have? Well, things change, and then we feel disappointed and betrayed. And the perception that things are, are our nature, which is uh, the third characteristic, I think maybe you all know these this list of three characteristics of um, impermanent, unreliable, uh, not self, or we could say uncontrollable. That's sort of a corollary of things not being personal is that we can't control them. If they were personal, we'd be able to control them. Um, so obviously this can sound like it's describing mes metaphysical reality or something that we should believe, but um, but it's just something, it's just a way of looking that's intended to show how we, we create suffering and stress for ourselves by expecting or hoping for permanence and reliability in conditions and thinking that we can control things. And so what would it be like to practice seeing, you know, things as constantly changing? And I think we maybe have all experienced that this can actually be joyful. You know, people talk about being in the flow. And when you're in the flow, you don't you're not banking on things staying the same or getting to a final destination. You're enjoying that you're in the flow. You're enjoying that things are constantly changing, but you're there, you're engaged. You're not expecting some final state of resolution, reliability. 
you're happy that things, you know, to, to engage with things as they are. Your, your happiness isn't dependent on conditions, really. It's dependent on, you know, sort of the qualities of the mind that are being brought forth, the wholesome qualities. So that's just one example of how these teachings, certain teachings that may even sound like something describing some ultimate reality, we can use them just to see how the mind may be clinging. And that's really all the teachings, if they're helpful, are helping us understand how our minds cling and create suffering and how they can release and being at least interested in that possibility of the mind releasing, being at ease, being at peace with things as they are. Do we need to cling in order to be functional, responsive, engaged? That's a really interesting question. And we wouldn't probably, that question may not have done on us without some of these teachings, which can sound so radical and, and are. But we just check it out in our own direct experience. So then the last kind of wisdom is realization. And I think of this as moments where it's just, it's just, it's in, intuitive. It's intuitively clear. Something just we, we know something for ourselves about the mind about ourselves um, so this is sometimes called insight and yeah it's usually um, yeah you know we might describe it in words to someone afterwards and it might or to ourselves and it might sound just really simple you know like I was saying ill will is painful ill will hurts ill will doesn't seem to be helpful so it's like it's not rocket science and it's something that we've already read but seeing it for ourselves or even just that it's that it's possible to relate without ill will in this situation or that seeing that that that's possible so that's these moments of realization are always happening sort of on the edge of where we might think um you know clinging is justified <laughs> clinging is justified in this area and then we check it out and we we experiment maybe maybe not and so this happens on its own um organically we don't make it happen it's like cytotagenia says we collect the data and then when there's enough data wisdom arises or wisdom does the job of letting go um so it's it's like we don't need to tell ourselves to let go of a hot pan if we're touching it and we're aware that we're touching it. So like that, in terms of our actual practice, a lot of it is just this kind of sensitizing our instrument that collects the data. Because our instrument, <laughs> for, for a lot of us, speaking for myself, is not always, you know, at its most refined. And that's where a lot of the work around Don and Sila is helpful, just kind of like stabilizing this instrument, Don and Sila, and just so many conditions. I mean, just it's stressful being a human being. So there's a lot we can't control, but um, but the, the practices of Don and Sila and renunciation definitely go a long way towards stabilizing and, and meditation and just cultivating you know, learning the, the cultivation of, of letting go. Yeah, so that then our mind is more sensitive and our lives are, our lives are maybe less stressful you know, to whatever degree we can affect that. And then we're collecting the data and, um, and we start to see things. And this, this, this kind of scene is really powerful because it's not, dependent on anything anyone else has told us, even though it arises due to taking in other people's wisdom and then putting it into practice. But it's something that 
we've seen for ourselves. Um, so it's less susceptible to, yeah, being influenced by others or even our own our own doubt. Um, and again, these, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily something that is complicated or that, um, yeah, super impressive. It's just kind of a lot of it, at least for me, is just kind of seeing the way my mind works and it's conditioned and having a little bit more, yeah, understanding of that, taking it less personally, seeing it as just stuff. It's just stuff, just stuff that the mind does. Understanding that it's conditioned, you know, it arises under certain causes and conditions. Working with things on that level of causes and conditions and not just as self and self attributes. So again, it's this kind of know-how, you know, just like any, any pursuit, you know, over time, we get better at things. We learn how to do things better. And there's an ease and a comfort and a confidence that comes from that, just like that in observing our own minds with the uh, aim to understand suffering and release, we start, we start to learn. And, uh, and these, these are inspiring. These encourage us to keep going, even if it's just, you know, a moment here and there, but that flavor is sort of unmistakable, the flavor of peace, the peace of uh, not creating as much suffering for ourselves and seeing that it's suffering is an activity that the mind creates. And when we see that, it's really, yeah, it really impels us onward to keep, yeah, to keep going, even if we don't quite understand how it all works. It's kind of mysterious, this process by which awareness illuminates and and then letting go happens on its own. Wisdom is what lets go. It's not us that lets go, even though we can read all the teachings about letting go and tell ourselves, let go, let go, let go. It's when we feel, often at least for me, it's when awareness is stable enough to be sensitive to what's happening and we see there's something we weren't aware of something we were kind of taking for granted or yeah just not able to just being too reactive to what's present to really settle with it so a lot of it it's not conceptual in my experience but just what are the conditions that allow us to be with our experience, to feel what it feels like to be me. A lot of the time, I don't wanna feel what it feels like to be me because there's a lot of pain involved in being a human, just inevitably, even if we have relatively fortunate circumstances. We all experience the pain of loss, the pain of change, the pain of uncertainty. So it, it's, and especially with all the distractions available to us in modern life, it's no wonder that we're not always that interested or making the effort needed to really be sensitive, to be, you know, to be quiet enough to even hear, you know, our inner voice. So I think a lot of the work in terms of supporting wisdom is just that sort of patience and that um, confidence and courage and um, forbearance to kind of show up in our lives to be in our lives, to be sensitive. But the, the, what we get from that, the payout, is that you can't really have wisdom without being present in your life. So you can't really learn you know, what works and what doesn't work if we're not paying attention. And that's really why, why mindfulness is the core of, of the practice, is just, just through sustaining that, we learn. And so it's kind of amazing that it happens on its own to a degree. Um, the learning, the wisdom happens on its own. We just show up as best we can. And sometimes we can't show up maybe. And so we learn how to 
step back from experience, how to skillfully distract ourselves so that in other moments we can show up more fully. But, you know, stumble by stumble, you know, we just keep connecting, you know, showing up as best we can with awareness, keep gathering data, and we keep seeing, we keep learning, we keep connecting the dots, and we keep being a little bit more free, a little bit more, have a little bit more capacity in more areas of our life to be in our life as it is uh, and show up in a skillful way. And that's really the direction that the practice goes in so that, um, yeah, more and more skill and ease and creativity and nimbleness in being who we are, not being somebody else, but in being, you know, you know, being with the conditions that are present. And that's really a beautiful thing that uh, what gets transformed is our understanding and our ability to meet life as it is. So life is still the same. Our personality, conditioning, body, the world, still, still as it is, but we're a little more, we know, we know it a little more and, and we, we know how to work with it a little more. And so we, yeah, we suffer less and uh, even have moments where it's not a problem. None of it's a problem because we know what to do with it. It's like Mark sometimes says, a mountain is on, only heavy if you try to lift it. And that's so much what we're learning with wisdom is, you know, just the specificity of how clinging creates suffering and the possibility, which, we, you know, we rarely really uh, you know, have a sense of, of not, not creating problems, being at peace with conditions. Doesn't mean we don't like them or that everything is okay and that we don't engage, but yeah, that not getting entangled so this is kind of a, I think it's simple, but it's it's profound. This book, I'll just close by mentioning this book because I think it's really related to this point. Uh, the Buddha Before Buddhism. In this book, the it's a really early text. And so a lot of the systematic teachings aren't present. And a lot of what's talked about is the the sage, you know, the wise person, the sage, and what the sage does. And the sage is interested in peace. The sage isn't interested in defending any doctrine, getting caught up in any doctrine, proving themselves by being the best, uh, uh, the best monastic, or so all these ways, these really human ways that we get caught up pursuing sensual pleasure. The sage is interested in 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 peace, uh, and doesn't and isn't depending on any particular condition for that peace. It's through relating in a peaceful way with the conditions that are present that the sage is developing training in peace. So it's such a simple message that we can certainly understand and, and we can try it out. What would it be like to be peaceful with things as they are now? Totally present with them but what's that dart in the heart? That's an image that's used. The dart in the heart that makes us flail, flail around and cause problems. My thoughts here and you know, curious about it or your own experience with, um, yeah, distinguishing with wisdom what's supportive, what's onward leading and what's not. Yeah, so any anything that comes to mind would be great to hear from, from folks. I'll turn off the recording. <laughs>